this morning was awesome. And uh, I don't know, I was just really feeling the heart of the Lord for everybody in here this morning. Like, uh, I'm so blessed. Y'all don't even know. Y'all don't even know how blessed you are. I don't even know how blessed I am just to be part of this church family. You know what I'm saying? To, 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 to go through things um, for my stumbling, my mistakes, my missteps. You know what I'm saying? The grace and the mercy that has been extended, extended to me. Dang, thanks, Nathan. <laughs> the grace and the mercy that's been extended to me has been, I mean, amazing. And, and, and uh, it's just such a blessing to be part of a body that can bring instruction, that can bring correction, that can bring love, that can bring encouragement, uh, that is bold, that, 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 that my brothers and sisters have the confidence to approach me with concerns. I mean, it is, it is really genuinely, I think, uh, the Lord's model of what a family is supposed to be. It, it is building up, it is encouraging, it is correcting, and that is awesome. So this morning as I was over there just worshiping the Lord, I was just really feeling the Lord's heart, just the love, just almost as if he was smiling upon this house with, with the, the way that things are moving um, and in agreement with, with what Rod says, just, you know, to be thankful, you know, be thankful and that, that uh, sometimes our greatest growth occurs in the most uncomfortable situations. If we just press in and, and be steadfast and, be, and remain faithful to him, he is also faithful to us. And uh, it's just so funny, so funny the way the Lord ties things together because uh, he was talking about discipleship and cleaning fish. And just two days ago, my friend Brandon made me go fishing with him, like twisted my arm bad. And, um, and when we went, I bet we caught over 100 fish. I mean, we were slaying them one after the other. We brought 45 home. And of course, I, brought, I caught five more than him to bring home. You know, that's what's important. <laughs> But uh, when we were cleaning the fish, I was cleaning them fish. Have you ever cleaned 25 fish? I bet it took me, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes. But when I got to about fish number 20, I was like, good night, cleaning these boogers. Good night. And we ended up with about four or five pounds of crappie that I put in the freezer. And I don't know what he ended up with. But uh, Rod is so right. Catching the fish, it's wild. You know, the, the, the harvest field, you know, the Lord asks us to pray for the harvesters. For the, the harvest is ripe, but, the, you know, the... They're right for the picking, but uh, the harvesters are little. And so I think we need to continue to do what was asked and that we could pray that the Lord would send harvesters, um, first and foremost. And, and secondly, you know, when Rod also was talking about, you know, the, the rapture, some of the things, you know, and, and what it's talking about in First Thessalonians chapter 4 where we're caught up. You know, we love that we, we get stuck on that. And the Lord's really been, uh, you know, showing me some stuff about triggers, you know, my triggers, your triggers, and what happens when something is said that we don't necessarily agree with or that goes maybe against a little bit of what we understand or interpret. And, um, and when we're triggered, we shut down. We don't even know we do it. But when you are triggered, you shut down for any period of time. It might be 30 seconds, 2 minutes, 3 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes. But when a trigger is spoken, we will shut down for an extended period of time until we can come to a place of peace and begin to receive from that individual again. And um, with that being said, we, a lot of times we get so caught up on, um, you know, the rapture. And, and something I've been learning is really funny is we like to get caught up whether post, pre, or mid-tribulation on what's going to happen. But so many times you don't hear it taught on that not only are we going to be caught up, but right after we're caught up, we get sent right back down to rule and reign with the Lord on earth for a thousand years. Has anybody ever thought about that? Like, how are we so concerned when we go when he actually just sends us right back? Isn't that wild? Anywho, um, we're going to talk today about a few things, and, and you already know. You already know that I have tons and tons and tons and tons of scriptures. Um, so, this will be like the, the, the I guess we're going to kind of start like an engine, you know, we're going to have to get warmed up. Uh, so, we're going to go through a few of these things to actually get where I want to get in uh Oh, what's funny is I finally, you know, my awesome friend is always asking me for a title and I never have one. And the one time I have a title, my friend don't even ask me for it. So <laughs> uh, that's all right. There's, there's grace all the way around. So what I ultimately want to talk about today is what's going to, the, the title of this will be called Grace and Truth. Grace and Truth. Um, 
But like I said, before we get to that, we're going to kind of rev up a little bit. And, uh, and I was going through some stuff uh, a couple of weeks ago, listening to some things, reading, you know, just studying. And uh, the Lord, I felt like, started talking to me about being grafted in, being grafted in uh, the branch, being grafted onto the tree. You know, Jesus tells us that, uh, you know, that he's the root or he, he's the vine and we are the branch. And uh, so I'm, you can turn there if you like. I'm, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 11. And I'm going to read uh, 11, verse 24. I know, I know it's a lot. This is just the beginning, I'm telling you. So I hope you guys came uh, today ready to ingest uh, the Lord, because we're going to go through his uh, words tremendously. So uh, Romans chapter 11, verses uh, 11 through 24. I'll read it out of the New Living Translation. It says, Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. His purpose was to make his salvation available to the Gentiles and then to the Jews. Hold on. And then the Jews would be jealous and want it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the Jews turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when the Jews finally accept it. I am saying all of this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to find a way to make the Jews want what you Gentiles have, and in that way, I might save some of them. For since the Jews' rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, <clears throat> how much more wonderful their acceptance will be. It will be life for those who were dead, and since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their children will also be holy." For if the roots of the tree are holy, and the, then the branches will be too. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, <clears throat> some of the Jews have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, were grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in God's rich nourishment of his special olive tree. But you must be careful not to brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. Remember, you are just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches, the Jews, were broken off because they didn't believe God, and you were there because you do believe. Don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the branches he put there in the first place, he won't spare you either." Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe to those who disobeyed, but he was kind to you who continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the Jews turn from their unbelief, God will graft them back into the tree again. He has the power to do it. For if God was willing to take you who were by nature branches from a wild olive tree and graft you into his own good tree, a very unusual thing to do, he will be far more eager to graft the Jews back into the tree where they belong. <clears throat> so, I, I believe I'm a Gentile. I don't think that I'm Jewish. But the Lord in his graciousness, because the Jewish, some of the Jewish people rejected um, you know, Jesus, the, the Messiah, uh, then the Lord broke that branch off and has grafted me into him. He is the tree. You understand that? And, uh, and with that being said, because I am a branch that is grafted into the tree, I inevitably will take on the attributes of the tree. Are you following me? And so, uh, I was listening to this guy, and he was, telling, he was talking about some stuff that was just astonishing to me. And I had to go and visit with my, my sister, my sister Kim. She's, I think, upstairs because she's a nurse. And I had to ask her a few things just this morning just to make sure that I was on the same page. And what I learned is that uh, we humans, we have five liters of blood, five liters of blood inside of us on average. Some of us might have a little more because we're a little larger. Some of us might have a little bit less because we're a little smaller, but on average, we have five liters of blood. And say you were involved in an accident of some sort and you lost a whole bunch of blood when they, and you would have to have what's a blood transfusion. You know, they cannot, they will not give you more than 2.5 liters of blood, even if it's the same blood type because your body will then in turn begin to fight that as a foreign item inside of itself. And it made me think about this passage, that when we are grafted in, it is not my blood that's going to transform God. That's 
I am never going to transform him into my image. Never, no matter how much I try. And believe me, I try. <laughs> However, it is his blood that transforms me, the branch, into the image of the root. You know, and, and, and in all of this, it is to produce fruit. Because if you think about a tree, what produces fruit? Not the trunk and not the roots. It's the branches. It's the branches that produce the fruit. However, it's the nourishment from the trunk that feeds the branch in order for the fruit to grow. And fruit happens, um, I don't know what to say. Um, my fruit, your fruit, our fruit, doesn't develop necessarily of our works doesn't necessarily happen by the things that we try or don't try to do. It happens by staying connected to the trunk. And the trunk, through the roots, picks up nutrients, which goes to the branch, which develops fruit. You understand? Is everybody following me with that? So um, I just thought that that was super, super wild uh, that in a 24-hour period, they will not give you more than 2.5 liters of blood because your body will reject it. And, and, and again, I just thought that that was wild. That's wild. So you can take on, the, the, the trunk can take on a foreign object, but the foreign object will never take over the original, you know, intent. So, uh, and then Jesus spoke of that in John chapter 15, um, verses 1 through 4. And uh, I think ultimately we're probably going to, we I know we are, we're going to hang out in John today a little bit which is fantastic because my brother Nathan up over there, he's, he's actually in John chapter 5, uh, nearing the end of it uh, for the men's Bible study. For those of you, uh, nearing the end of chapter 5, for those of you that are interested, we're actually, he's actually putting on the study for the book of John. It is phenomenal. I mean, there's so many things happening outside of just the Bible study. For instance, Uncle Tim, that I only know is Uncle Tim. <laughs> so Uncle Tim is everybody's uncle. <laughs> But, uh, you know, that there's, there's amazing uh, illumination of God's word. There's insight. There's wisdoms. There's testimonies. Uh, we take a few minutes at the end of it to pray for each other. We have praise requests and prayer requests. Listen, please take a few moments and plug in. Plug in with, with us. Plug in with your brothers. It, it, it can only do you good. And if it doesn't, it will. There's no, it doesn't. It will. It'll only be good for you. So, uh John chapter 15, wow, my, get it together, McCollum. John chapter 15, verses uh, 1 through 4, this is Jesus speaking here. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned for greater fruit, fruit. You have already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me. So there's Jesus himself saying how important it is to be connected to him. You know, it is, it is such a blessing for me to come to this house and be connected to the Lord and, and, and get different things from whoever's delivering the word and have these little conversations before and after church. This is nourishment. This is nourishment for the branch that is ultimately going out into the world and producing fruit. So uh, it's super important for us to remain, um, first of all, to be grafted in. To be grafted into the tree is going to require salvation. But after salvation, you remain um, connected to the vine in which a transformation will occur. A transformation will occur. And let me tell you, the transformation isn't going to be you making your own God. <laughs> the transformation is going to be you conforming to his plans and his purposes through his grace and through his mercy, but ultimately leading you into truth. Ultimately leading you into truth. So, uh, you know, if we're, if we're to take on the attributes of the vine or produce fruit from the vine, we'll have to know and understand the vine. You understand? So let's take a look at the vine and turn with me to John chapter 1 and go to verse 14. This is where we'll actually get to rocking and rolling with grace and truth. Now I'm going to read this, John chapter 1, verse 14. 
out of the King James out of the King James version and it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth now real big in my notes how we got here this was just grace and truth. And near the end of it last night, the Lord illuminated the word full to me. So in my notes, in capital letters, it says full, F-U-L-L. It says grace, G-R-A-C-E. And it says truth, T-R-U-T-H. And, and so full of is little, grace is big, you know, and is little, and truth is big. And it's funny for some other things that the Lord is teaching me. But if you go back to the beginning, it says, and the word was made flesh. I got a question. What word was made flesh? What word was made flesh? I propose it was the Old Testament that was made flesh because we didn't have a New Testament yet. This was the beginning of the New Testament. So the word that was made flesh, it ultimately was Jesus, but he was the human form. He was the epitome of the Word of God at that time was the Old Testament. Is everybody following me? So, <clears throat> according to Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, I believe that we're called to live and love with grace and truth. We're called to live and love with grace and truth. So, if you, you can turn, I'll turn over there. You can turn over there if you'd like. Ephesians chapter 5, well, that's Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Out of the New Living Translation, it says, Follow God's example in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Is Lonnie in here? Lonnie's outside. Ah. Number two, live a life filled with love for others, following the example of Christ. Okay, so verse 2, it says, Live... A life filled with love for others, following the example of Christ, who loved you and gave himself as a sacrifice to take away your sins. And God was pleased because that sacrifice was like sweet perfume to him. So there's a couple of things here. I want you to understand that Christ lived his life as a sacrifice. So if we are to live in love, as Christ did. Now, if you jump back over there to John chapter 1, verse 14, it says he was full of grace and truth. Now, that's where I'm coming up with. We are to live in love full of grace and truth. The root or the tree trunk that us branches are grafted into is full of grace and truth. He's full of both of them. Not one of them, but both of them. He loved you, and I'm, I'm supposed to follow his example. I'm supposed to love you, and you're supposed to love me. And he gave himself as a sacrifice. And y'all are family, and sometimes I don't want to be around my family. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I would have to think that sometimes my brothers and sisters don't want to be around me. But to live like Christ lived, he gave his life as a sacrifice for my benefit. Therefore, I should give my life as a sacrifice for your benefit. Therefore, you should give your life as a sacrifice for my benefit. This is all unilateral. This isn't just for me, and it isn't just for you, but for all of us collectively, because we make up the body of Christ in which Christ is the head. You guys following all that? So, again, we're called to live in love following the example of Christ. So what was Christ's example as he dwelt among us in John 1.14? I just told you this is a Q&A. He was full, he was full, full of grace, and he was full of truth. Okay, I want you to understand a couple of things here. First of all, grace saves. Grace saves, okay? And truth sets you free. Do you understand that? Okay. Where do I get that from? Grace saves, truth frees. <clears throat> Turn with me to Ephesians. 
We're, we're going to bounce back and forth, just to give you guys a heads up. We're going to bounce back and forth between Ephesians and John. Ephesians and John. Ephesians and John. Ephesians and John. Okay. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I'll read it out of the, out of the uh, King James. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, but is the gift of God. What does that say? By grace, you are saved. Does it say, by truth, you are saved? Wow, there's so much participation today. <laughs> there's so much participation today. It doesn't say, by truth, you were saved. It doesn't. It says, by grace, you were saved. Number nine says that it's not of works, lest any man should boast. How many of us, none of y'all, how many times <laughs> did I try to work out my salvation? <laughs> because, you know, the Word of God does say, um, you know, that every man works out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Somewhere, so which is it? Am I working out my salvation with fear and trembling, or am I receiving salvation only through the grace of God? Huh. Huh. Just a thought. <laughs> it's by the grace. It's by the grace. So, so with that being said, we'll, we'll, I'll just, we'll, we'll kind of cheat a little, but if you want to stay in the same chapter and go to number 10, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, <laughs> which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, there's an order to this. I don't know if y'all recognized it, but it was grace first, and then ultimately, after grace, after your salvation, you come into truth, and only when you come into truth, then will you do the works that the Lord pre predestined you for. Now, let me tell you what happens, not with y'all, but with me, I got it mixed up. <laughs> I thought I could go to work to get saved on my good works. I serve, 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 and fell out of church and went to church and fell out of church and went to church and fell out of church and went to church. And then the grace of the Lord encountered me. And that works predestined is nothing you do in and of yourself. That is a fruit that develops by staying connected to the tree trunk. So grace saves. Are we clear that grace saves? Crystal clear? Okay. Okay. Now, truth frees. Truth frees. Go with me to John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Makes me feel good that I got there before Nathan's Bible study. John chapter 5, I'm in John chapter 8. Uh, uh, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. New Living Translation, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Are you following? Grace saves, truth frees. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to deliver truth to people in order to get them saved, and it failed. When I bring some, when somebody comes through those doors and they're a mess, and I want to hammer them with they're a sinner and they're going to burn in hell, and you got to stop doing drugs and you got to stop doing this and you got to get married and you got to blah 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 blah, they turn around and they walk away. <laughs> Is it the truth? Absolutely. But had they yet received grace? Jesus was full of grace and truth. We are called to live, to love with grace and with truth. There is an order, I'm telling you. So this is where this message gets a little bit into a word study. Uh, um, so bear with me just for a few, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, do any of y'all got a concordance at home, a Strong's, about yay big, like crazy? <laughs> it's awesome. It's, I don't know. 
My mama bought it for me 10 years ago. I just read it, a little thing. She wrote me a cool little note, made me feel loved. I thought, man, you are so amazing, Mom. At the time, I thought, well, I'm going to read with this thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, uh, 10 years later, I should call her and tell her thank you. She believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. That's what grace does. That's what grace does. So uh, <laughs> something that I'm, 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 I'm a student, I'm learning. I, don't, I do not have it all put together. A lot of the classes that we do, I'm so grateful for the classes that we do because it isn't so much the teacher talking at, but it's really just uh, who you could call the teacher is actually just facilitating an opportunity for the move of the Spirit. So it isn't that, that I, per se, have the answers, that I develop a question, I propose a question, and the Holy Spirit, through each of the participants, begins to give a piece of the puzzle until we have a greater revelation, a greater understanding. That is awesome. That is what, that is, what is happening here in some of these classes. That's what's happening at, at Nathan's Bible study. That's what's happening at Elani's prophetic class. You know, we have a concept, we present the concept, and then we discuss it. Sometimes we come to an agreement, a conclusion of, okay, that was amazing, and other times we have minor disagreements, but that doesn't mean we stop loving each other. It doesn't. So uh, some of the stuff that I learned that I've, I just want to share with you all, to me, I thought it was like a miracle, and then I shared it with my wife, and she was like, yeah, you didn't know that? And I'm like, mm, okay, well, <laughs> you're amazing. <laughs> Uh, so what I learned last night was uh, Greek words are only found in the New Testament if you're looking in the Strong's Concordance, and the Hebrew words are only found in the Old Testament. To me, I thought that that was something magical. My wife was like, yeah, that's just common knowledge. I'm like, hmm. well, maybe I should have knew that. I should have asked you about that. <laughs> and, and I learned it's because, you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and so it'll have like all these, all this, you know, you can find the same word, like you can find grace in the Old Testament and you can find grace in the New Testament. When you find it in the Old Testament, it says H, H with a number. When you find it in the New Testament, it says G with a number, H for Hebrew, G for Greek. Anywho, so gr grace in the Greek is the word charis. And if you or want to check up on me, go ahead. I would hope that is what it is all about. You lay what I've learned down to what you've learned and then we discuss it. We don't argue about it. We discuss it, and that's how we sharpen each other. So that would be uh, G5485, if, if you're into studying this stuff, which is derived from the Greek word Cairo. And I started to get excited here because we've been talking about chronological and kairos, and I was like, oh, maybe they're the same. And then the Lord was like, no, no, no not exactly. <laughs> so uh, charis is actually from the word kairo, and that's the meaning of it. So we're looking at the, gr the word grace in the, in the Greek language. It means graciousness of a manner or act. It is the undeserved kindness, it is the favor, and it is the goodwill of God. And me, just in checking this stuff out, I'm like, well, What's Greece in the Hebrew? What's grace in the Hebrew? And so um, I found that there's a whole bunch of them, a bunch of different meanings, which is really awesome also. So grace in the Hebrew is hain, H-E-N, but long E, hain. And it's, uh, it's the Hebrew word 2581, if you're interested. And it's the root word of the Hebrew word hainan, meaning to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. And so when you begin to study some of this stuff out and really understand what grace is, you know, it, it, it is, it's the undeserved kindness, you know, it's the favor, it's the goodwill of God. But when you see the Hebraic language is pictorial and circular, where the Greek language is linear, you know what I'm saying? You can see it in a line and it's just, yeah, to the point. There's so much depth, so much more meaning to the original languages uh, that were spoken in the time, regardless of the translation. And the original language of the time was actually Aramaic slash Hebrew, but then was translated into the Greek for us to be able to understand it. So it just caught me. In the, in the, in the Hebrew, the word grace means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior like, God loves us that much that in his kindness, he's willing to bend down, to stoop down to us, to offer us something that's undeserved, which is grace. So grace is traditionally known to us, you know, it's freely given, unmerited favor of God. That would just be our traditional uh, definition. I did Webster's. I did all kinds of stuff. But this is, we just broke it down to a traditional. Grace is the traditionally known as a freely given, unmerited favor of God. And then, of course, you know we had to do the word truth. We can't do grace without doing the word truth. 
So we did truth, and in Greek it's uh, aletheia, which is G225 if you want to check it out. And it, it very, very, again, to me, it's amazing how the Greek is very pinpoint to the point. And uh, in the Greek, the word truth means true. It means truly, it means truth, it means verity. It is what it is. There isn't really much of a variance. Well, then the truth in the Hebrew is amet, which is H571, meaning stability. It's truth is stability. Figuratively, certainty, trustworthiness. It is extracted from the primitive root word, a man, which again blew me away because I am a man <laughs> and made me think about a bunch of other things, but it means to properly build up or support. The truth means to foster as a parent, to, re- to render firm and faithful. So I, I, I just want to say how important it is when you're looking some of this stuff up to look it up in its original context. Not that, it's, not that what we got here is, is bad in any way, shape, or form, but there is such a richness to these things that we tend to miss by just taking a word at face value when there was so much more depth and meaning to it. Are you following me? So truth is traditionally known as the true or actual state of the matter. Okay. Now that we went over all of our definitions and understood that Jesus was full of grace and truth, let me ask you, if you thought of this as a pendulum, you know, a pendulum swings back and forth, whoop, 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 pendulum, and grace was on one side and truth was on the other side, which side would you swing to? You don't have to answer that question, but just think about it yourself. You know you. You know you. The Lord knows you. You know, when, when, uh, when somebody walks in and drops a glass of water in the floor, do you give them grace and go, huh, I should help you pick that up? Or you, do you give them truth? Well, if he wasn't so retarded, you wouldn't have dropped it. Just an example, do you swing to the side of grace or do you swing to the side of truth? I've noticed myself, me personally, I tend to swing to the side of truth. Um, Is that bad? No. Is it good? No. (laughs) Is that bad? Yes. Is that good? Yes. (laughs) Which is it? So when you're part of the body, these things are needed. It's important for me to swing to the side of truth, just like it's important for my wife to swing to the side of grace. And when you put us together, we are the direct representation of Christ who is full of grace and truth. You follow me? So uh, I seem to swing on the extreme um, side of truth, depending on who I'm dealing with. (laughs) Um, it's changed too over the years, my children, you know, when my son was growing up, there was truth and no grace. Well, now he lives on his own and there's a lot of grace and a lot less truth. (laughs) My daughter still lives at home, so there's still a lot of truth and very little grace. When she moves out, I'll probably switch that and give her a lot more grace and a lot less truth. Uh, so, uh, man, you know, there's pros and cons to these both of them, you know, I, I tend to be on the extreme side of truth. Um, a lot of times this comes across as mean and nasty, or, uh, you know, it comes across as beating people up with rules and regulations, rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts. Why? Because I love them. I love them so much that I want to beat them up. But remember, truth frees. Truth frees from bondage. Do you got friends and family, co-workers that are tied up in bondage and you love them so much you just want to deliver the truth? And we forget to wrap it in grace and they run away? Nah, that's just me. That's just me. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've also, not near as much, but I've also been on the extreme side of grace. <laughs> Not the one giving it, of course, but uh, (laughs) 
I've been on the extreme side of grace where it doesn't matter what I do. My sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. So don't be judging me. (laughs) You see how that works? See, when you walk on either side of these extremes, it's going to create two extreme problems. Okay? Are you following me? Truth without grace almost always leads to rebellion. Truth without grace almost always leads to rebellion. If I only share and exercise truth with no understanding, no love, no empathy, no grace, right is right, wrong is wrong, people tend to reject the truth and rebel against it. Isn't that wild? Um, when, when, when my wife and I were recommitting ourselves to the Lord and to one another after some catastrophic events, um, done from me to her and then also from her to me. Uh, the Lord uh, extended grace and mercy to the both of us, and then he began to bring us into truth. Um, and as he, he, he brought um, us at different levels, there were different times where she was way ahead of me in her truths, which are also my truths, but I wasn't yet ready to hear them. And then there were times when I was a little bit more ahead of her that she wasn't ready to hear them. And... uh. We was in, a, in the season of learning about curses. We was in the season of learning about the curse of sin. We was in the season of learning about word curses, the things that you speak. And we was in the season of learning about generational curses, you know, where, where it says the sins of the father will be passed down to the third and the fourth generations. So the Lord doesn't let sin go unpunished. The sins of our forefathers can be upon our heads. He also says my people perish for lack of knowledge. If you don't know that, and you're underneath of a curse of wrong thought processes. Everything's wrong. Everything sucks. The world's horrible. Everything's bad. And why does it even matter? That might be a wrong thought process that was given to you from a forefather that you don't even recognize. That would be called a generational curse. We was in the process of learning this. And so the Lord shared it with me a little bit before he shared it with my lovely bride. And we went through a six-month process of every time she spoke, I corrected her with truth because I love her. And I wanted her free, but I didn't give her no grace, and she was ready to kill me. Every time she spoke, I break that curse in Jesus' name. I break that curse in Jesus' name. She's like, oh, I'm so sick and tired. I break that curse in Jesus' name. You're not sick and tired. You're blessed. You are amazing. You are whole. I'm broke. We don't have any money. You know what or not? I break that curse in Jesus' name. We are rich. We are highly favored. We got more than we need. I was hammering down with truth, and she was ready to leave me. I loved her. I just didn't do it with grace. It almost cost me dearly. Thank you, Lord, that you gave grace to the situation in order for her to endure my ridiculousness. (sighs) You ever see kids that grow up in a strict household? They got an authoritative, authoritarian father or mother. What happens when they grow up? They're like, deuces, mom and dad. Where's the club? Where's the club? All the ladies and the gentlemen I want to hang out with and do some drinking and some partying and do everything that my mom and dad told me I couldn't do. Woohoo! Freedom! That's what truth produces with no grace. It produces rebellion. When we try to lead with rules, regulations, law, religion, Without relationship and grace, it will always lead to rebellion. And we know what rebellion is. And 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, For rebellion is is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry. Now, that's I love to say that. It sounds so great rolling off of my tongue until the Lord spins it around and goes, are you causing your brothers to stumble with your extreme truths? Am I causing my brother to stumble? Am I causing him to rebel, which is as witchcraft? Am I causing him to be stubborn, which is iniquity, because I'm hammering him with truth and no grace? Wow, how the Lord spun that around to like, yeah, they suck. Yeah, get them, Lord. And he's like, no, 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 no. You're participating in their failure. 
Woo! And just a thought. <laughs> and then we got, uh, we got number two. That what I just gave you was the first extreme problem when we tend to swing on the extreme side of truth. Now, the number two extreme problem is when we tend to hang out on the side of extreme grace. Okay? Grace without truth leads to being taken advantage of. Do we have any parents in here? No, of course not. I'm the only parent where my child children have moved out and I've given them grace and then they just think that they can steamroll me with, can I get more? 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 Do we have any relationships with friends where we know that they lied about us, but we gave them a little bit of grace and then they keep lying and keep lying and keep lying and keep lying? Where do we draw the line? Because Jesus was full of grace and truth. Grace without truth leads to relativism. Relativism is the belief that truth is not always the same, but it varies according to the circumstances. Do you hear that? Relativism is also the belief that there is no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth. That's what grace does when you swing to the wrong side. I don't want to say you swing to the wrong side. That was a bad way to say it. It's always good to walk in grace. It's always good to walk in truth. When you swing to the extreme side, when we're not so much down the middle, you know, where we have to extend grace and we have to extend truth, but when we're on the extreme side of grace, um, you know, grace, 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 grace. You got to show them, you got to show them Jesus. No accountability. Let them do whatever they want. <laughs> that leads to being taken advantage of and it leads to relativism. So grace without truth leads, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> if there's no such thing as absolute truth, then there's your truth and my truth. <laughs> I don't agree with you because that ain't my truth. When there's your truth and my truth, um, then nobody can tell you how to live and God can't communicate with you because there's no absolute <laughs> You know, there's no such thing as truth when you function with all grace. So grace without truth leads to the conclusion that nothing really matters. And it doesn't really matter what you do or what you don't do. It's all going to work out anyway. Who cares? You see what that does when you roll with all extreme grace? It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you have a good heart and you're sincere and you don't hurt anybody. I can be gay because there's no real truth. The truth of God's word says that you was created in his image. He created them male and female. That's what his truth says. But he gives you grace until you're ready to receive that. Grace without truth leads to love and acceptance. Love and acceptance and absolutely no definitive standards. It's a free-for-all. So my question is, is how do I respond today? I want you to think about that. How do you respond today? How do you respond to any given circumstance or situation depending on who you're dealing with? You know, there's people in my life I don't know the Lord's place there. I can't stand them. <laughs> I want to give them truth. But the Lord's asking me to give them grace. And then there's other people that the Lord's placed in my life that I love them to pieces, and they get away with murder. Because instead of giving them grace, maybe I should give them truth. <laughs> so I just want you to reevaluate, or just to evaluate, period. You know, do we live in love? Do we live in love, extending, being full of grace and truth? Remember, grace saves and truth frees. Grace comes first. 
Grace comes first. It's not truth. Um, remember in Romans 2.8, it says it's, it's, <laughs> it's the goodness, it's the kindness of God that brings men to repentance. I'm going to turn there just for giggles. You guys don't have to. But uh, <laughs> got a whole bookstore up here of markers. Whoa. Romans 2, verse 8. <laughs> Romans 2, verse 8. In the New Living Translation, it says, But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who... Oh, nope, that's right, number eight. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey truth and practice evil deeds. And we'll come over here in the King James. It's so important to check out multiple versions of your Bibles because they give a greater depth, a greater clarity... Number 8 in the King James, Romans 2, verse 8, it says, But unto them that are contentions and do not obey the truth, that can't can't be right. I think I got it wrong here, guys. I'm sorry, it's 2, verse 4, not 8. I don't got to start over. (laughs) Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says... uh, In the New Living Translation, don't you realize how kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Or don't you care? Can't you see how kind he has been in giving you time to turn from your sin? This says, don't you realize how kind he has been? Now over in the um, King James, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of the goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? Let me ask you, was it the truth of God that led you to repentance? It was his goodness. It was his kindness. You're never going to win anybody to the Lord with beating them up over the head with truth. If you do, let me know, because I'd like to take some notes. Because I love to deliver truth. Grace is undeserved, and it cannot be earned by works. As soon as we think we deserve grace, it's no longer grace. This has been a hard lesson for me to learn. I think I'm still learning about grace. When the Lord was restoring my wife and myself, everybody kept saying, oh, you're just under the grace of God. And I was like, what does that mean? Oh, you're just in the Lord's grace. And I'm like, if you tell me that one more time, I'm going to choke slam you. What does that mean? I had no grid that I was that the Lord in his kindness was stooping down and offering me undeserved favor because what I deserved was a penalty for my sin. And he opted to overlook that. There was truth that I was a sinner and need to be judged for the things that I did wrong, but he offered grace. And he gave me the opportunity. You know, he says that, that, that God is a righteous judge He is our righteous judge, but mercy triumphs over judgment. He's a merciful God. Try to to remember that when you're hammering down on judgment. For the woman that's late to work and trying to drop her kid off at the babysitter and she cuts you off at traffic and you just cussed her out. Maybe you didn't cuss her out, but you didn't bless her. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Remember, grace saves in Ephesians 2, verses 8 9, and truth frees in John 8, 31 and 32. You guys just hang out right there, but just for giggles, I just really want to read it one more time. You know why I want to read it, don't you? Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing of the asunder of the soul and the spirit. You know, I can stand up here and tell you every pretty little story in the whole wide world, but his word cuts through the nonsense. It cuts through the filters of what we think we know. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, not of works, lest any man boast. Does everybody understand that? You cannot earn salvation. Impossible. Even after you're saved, you can't earn it either. How do you earn something that's already been bought and paid for? And then truth free. Grace saves. Grace saves your soul. You know what your soul is, right? Your mind, your will, your emotion. It's what you think. It's what you want. It's what you feel. If the Lord controls that, you advance his kingdom. If the enemy controls what you want, what you think, what you feel, you advance his kingdom. You understand that? Here comes truth. Truth frees. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus said to the people who believed in him. Who did he say that to? The people that believed in him. The people that believed in him received grace. People that believed in him, that's us. That's, 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 that's the branch that's been grafted in to the, to the tree trunk. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So what's funny to all of this is the kicker for truth is in Ephesians 2, verse 10. That's where I got ahead of myself just a little bit ago. The kicker for truth is in verse 10. For we are not his workmanship created. Hold on, I'm sorry. Start over. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. First you receive grace, then you receive truth, then you do good works. You can't do good works to obtain grace to walk in truth. It's impossible. The simplicity of this is wild, right? So I was putting all this together, and and that, and that was kind of what I had in a nutshell, and then the Lord does what the Lord does. I started noticing that I had the word full in capital letters everywhere, just like I had the word grace and truth in capital letters. And the Holy Spirit last night was like, why don't you take a look at full? And I said, okay, let's take a look at full. (laughs) I'm a fool. (laughs) I I didn't say that. But I said, okay, let's take a look at the word full. The word full is Greek for pleiru. Pleiru. That's Greek 4137. It's meaning to fulfill. It's meaning to fill to full. It means to cram. Okay? Jesus was full of grace and truth. Now, I want you to think about this. Have you ever been to the restaurant? To a restaurant? Have you ever been to a restaurant? And, uh, and the waitress comes out and your, your water's empty and you're like, can you fill that up? And she fills that up full. Fully filled. And then she walks away and you go, hey, come get this and take it away. And she's like, what? When it is filled to full, do we get rid of it? We don't. We don't get rid of it. When it's filled to full, it is crammed. It is water is brimming at the top so that it is even touched. If you just stomp on the floor and the table shakes, it overflows. That's what Jesus was. He was full of grace and truth, so that if you even shook anything, if you even touched the hem of his garment, out of him flowed grace and truth. Think about that. Is that, that's what we're called to live in love, in grace, and truth. As followers of Christ, we're too to be full of grace and truth. And we need the Holy Spirit. We need discernment. We need His discernment, not our discernment. We need to have the ability to know and understand when to release grace and when to release truth. Because what happens when we mess it up? We damage people. We damage the ones that He gave His life for. When they need truth and we give them grace, we enable them, to, we enable them. We enable them to continue in the lifestyle in which they're in. 
Nobody in here, I hope not, but who has a 45-year-old living in their basement? That's enablement. They need, they need truth. You've overextended the grace. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when somebody really needs grace, when they're broken, when they're at their lowest point, and they're looking for a helping hand, the last thing you want to do is give them truth. So, uh, where are you today? Where am I today? I know that I have work ahead of me. You know, I have work ahead of me. And it's good work, according to Ephesians 2.10. You know, I'm his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's always about laying our life to the plumb line of Christ. Laying our life to Christ. There are amazing graces to laying your life to Christ. There's also difficult truths to laying your life to Christ. We will be called to move forward with him and to let things go. We'll be required to pick things up even when we don't understand it. And we'll be, we'll be required to love and lean on one another. I'm so grateful for you guys for allowing me to test things that I don't fully understand. I mean, it, it goes both ways. I mean, it feels so great and hurts so bad at the same time, but I know that it's because you love me. And I hope that I can convey the same. I only want to convey the heart of the Father to my brothers and sister. When I find an amazing revelation that I've stumbled across, and we don't fully grasp it or understand it. It doesn't, I'm not trying to do, I'm just trying to love my brothers and sisters. I found something that has impacted me. Let me share it with you. You know, live in love with grace and truth. So uh, let us pray. Um, maybe there's somebody in here that doesn't, really know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe there's somebody in here that doesn't fully, they heard the words that were spoken today about grace and truth, but they have yet to fully experience the grace of God. If that's the case, he wants to extend his unfailing love. He wants to extend his unmerited favor to you and through you. If that's you, I just ask that you would make that acknowledgement in your heart. And... uh <laughs> Make that acknowledgement in your heart, Lord. Lord, for whoever that may or Lord, for whoever that may be, Lord, I just ask that you would encounter them with grace. I ask that you would encounter them with love. I ask that you would let them experience who you are. Lord, I ask that you would give them the strength and the courage to reach out to you, to reach out for help. Lord, I ask that you would continue to surround them with men and with women that would constantly point them to you until they get the courage to verbally, out loud, cry out to you for their salvation. Um, and Lord, for, for, for those of us uh, that have experienced your grace and your truth, Lord, I ask that you would allow us to all be filled. I ask that you would allow us to all be filled to a playroom to an overflowing, to a crammed full capacity of your grace and your truth, Lord. And I ask that you would give us discerning eyes and softened hearts to recognize when we need to release truth and when we need to release grace. Lord, I ask that you would help us to advance your kingdom. I ask that you would help us to continue to, continue to love each other unconditionally. That that you meet us where we are and we meet each other where we are. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.